Hello and welcome to Environmentally Conscious Manufacturing, Module Number 4, How Policy Can Influence the Manufacturing Sector. We are so excited to present this new addition to Module 4, and we hope that it will lead to interesting discussions, and what emanates from this lecture will be useful inside and outside the classroom. It's important to understand the objectives of any lecture, and so we hope that you are able to broadly answer some of the questions posed on this slide. Why should those in science, technology, and engineering, and math be concerned with policy? How does policy impact the manufacturing sector, especially those companies that are trying to be more environmentally conscious? And can I influence public health as an engineer? These questions and more we hope will be answered for you during this lecture. So to share with you a brief overview, we're going to talk about the intersection of science, policy, and public health. Then we'll talk a little bit about how policy is made. But the bulk of our discussion will be reviewing a couple of specific policy case studies that are impacting Michigan. And then we will end with why scientists might want to be engaged more on the policy side. So this lecture is in two parts. As an engineer turned public health professional, I'm learning that science, public health, and policy cannot operate in silos. When I worked as a production supervisor for a chemical plant, as well as an environmental manager at an engine manufacturing facility, what was most important to me was not only that we met production or our production goals, but also the safety of the employees and the safety of our surrounding community. Everything that we engaged in in the manufacturing sector can either have a positive or negative impact on the public health of our communities. And when I say public health, let me share with you my definition. To me, public health is the acknowledgement and practice of providing a clean, clean quality environment where people live, play, work, and flourish. We know that there are not places, or there are places in the United States and even around the world where public health is not a priority. Even in the U.S., we have places where it is dangerous because of air pollution, water pollution, and solid waste for people to live that could negatively impact their public health. I wanted to share with you this blog shown on the screen from the EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson. She is the current administrator of the federal agency that is responsible for implementing and enforcing environmental regulations. In this particular blog on the Huffington Post, a progressive online environmental news source, Administrator Jackson talks about how clean air, which can only come through regulation and more advanced manufacturing, is important to her. She shares a personal story about her sons dealing with asthma. So even though her job is to make sure that the EPA regulates, she adds a human face to this issue and really pushes the envelope that environmentally conscious manufacturing is not only important in the plant, but also important to people. So how does our air get dirty? Well, I'm sure you have a pretty good idea. Industry, and most importantly, the generation of electricity. This is a graph from the US Energy and Information Administration, or known as the EIA, that shows the different sources of electricity generation. As you can see, the light blue line shows that coal remains the largest source of energy generation. Why is this important to public health? Well, according to a report from the Physicians on Social Responsibility, coal pollutants affect all major body organs and can lead to symptoms that contribute to four of the five leading causes of mortality in the United States. That means death. These top four are heart disease, cancer, stroke, and chronic lower respiratory disease. If these emissions continue to go unchecked, they threaten America's health and welfare. In addition, these pollutants lead to changes in our climate, which when more emissions contribute to the ground level ozone exposure, ozone has also been linked to asthma and premature death. So we see that this electricity generation issue is a manufacturing issue and can have direct public health impacts. So how do we deal with this? Well, that's when we explore one of the many political methods of trying to deal with regulating these emissions and really moving towards a clean energy future. A current initiative that will help diversify energy sources, that means so we don't only rely on coal, is renewable energy portfolio standards. 
Actually, in Michigan, this renewable energy standard will be on the ballot in the fall of 2012. A renewable energy standard basically forces the state to increase the percentage of energy that utilities provide from renewable sources like wind and solar. The current standard for Michigan is 10%, but this ballot is pushing for an increase to 25%. What's important to note is that wind energy is already attracting thousands of investments and jobs in Michigan, employing three to 4,000 people in 2011 alone. Citizens are going back to work because of this. Michigan currently gets 60% of its energy from dirty coal-fired power plants and sends $1.8 billion annually out of state to import coal. So this renewable portfolio standard will require 25% of Michigan's energy to come from clean renewable sources by 2025. It is estimated that this $10 billion of new investment in this clean energy source would create 44,000 jobs in Michigan, according to the American Wind Energy Association. So that's an example of a current initiative to influence and diversify cleaner sources of energy. But to make it happen, it has to go through our political process. So let's quickly review how a law is made at the federal agency level. I'm sure that you're aware of most of our prominent environmental laws that are already existent in this land that were enacted back in the 70s, like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Safe Drinking Water Act. While laws are made at both the federal and state level, we're gonna focus on the federal level for this example. A member of Congress starts by writing a bill. The motivation for writing this bill can either come from a constituent in their district, or it could be one of the many issues that the committee is concerned about. There are many different committees that can enact legislation. Once a bill is approved by both the Senate and the House, the proposed bill goes to the president who can either approve or veto. If the president approves the law, it's passed and it goes to the United States Code, which is where the codif codification, the final phase of all our laws are kept. So what's important is how we actually put this law to work. Once a law is official, here's how it's put into practice. Laws often do not include all the details needed to explain how an individual business, state or local government or others might follow the law. The United States Code would not tell you, for example, what the speed limit is in front of your house. In order to make the laws work on a day-to-day -day level, Congress authorizes certain government agencies, like the EPA, to create regulations. Regulations set specific requirements about what is legal and what isn't. For example, a regulation issued by the EPA to implement the Clean Air Act might explain what levels of a pollutant, such as sulfur dioxide, adequately protect human health and the environment. It would tell industries how much sulfur dioxide they can legally emit into the air and what the penalty will be if they emit too much. Once the regulation is in effect, EPA then works to help Americans comply with the law and enforce it. So we're gonna spend a little time talking about some of the committees that actually do this work. The committees that have the most impact on science, education, technology, and manufacturing are highlighted. I will try and give a really general picture of the issues these committees tackle. What's important to note is that the committees in the Senate and the House are not exactly the same, but can work on some similar issues. So let's talk about the Senate. The Appropriations Committee is extremely important in that it controls how money is distributed to the other committees. The Committee for Commerce, Science, and Transportation tackles issues that range from communications, highways, aviation, transportation, security, climate change disasters, and product safety. The Energy and Natural Resources Committee conducts legislative activity around topics like energy resources, development conservation, petroleum resources, and nuclear. Health, Education, and Labor looks at issues that encompass most of the major agencies like Health and Human Services, the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the FDA, and many others. Let's take a look at the House side. So we have the Agricultural Committee that deals with issues like the Farm Bill. And this is important because farmers and ranchers have the tools or need the tools to produce abundant and affordable food and fiber supply. 
In this farm bill, which is currently being reviewed for 2011 and 2012, are reviewed every five years and provide the majority of funding for federal nutrition programs. The Education and the Workforce Committee look at issues about higher education, revamping No Child Left Behind, job and job training, resource centers, and pre-K through 12 education. The Science, Space, and Technology Committee has jurisdiction over all energy research, development, demonstration projects, and all federally owned non-military labs. The Energy and Commerce Committee promotes commerce, public health, and energy technology. They are responsible for the nation's telecommunications, consumer protection, food and drug, environmental quality, and affordable energy. Information about each of these committees can be found on the web. So now that we've talked a little bit about how laws are put in place and what committees might be important for scientists and engineers, let's take a closer look at some federal legislation that will really have some significant impacts on the U.S. as well as the state of Michigan. So how do regulations affect manufacturing? We talked a little bit about the majority of our electricity being generated from coal-fired power plants. Well, some of the most important harmful emissions that can come from these plants is carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that essentially warm the earth and make current public health concerns worse. Greenhouse gas emissions include CO2, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. Energy related to CO2 emissions dominate the total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Coal is the second largest fossil fuel contributor and produces more CO2 per unit of energy than petroleum. The electric power sector is the largest source, accounting for 40% of all energy-related CO2 emissions. GHGs, or greenhouse gases, are an important issue. On March 27, 2012, the EPA proposed a carbon pollution standard that set national limits on the amount of carbon that power plants can emit. This was a result of a 2009 Supreme Court decision that determined that GHGs, greenhouse gases, were harmful which set the stage for this legislation. So, the next part of this lecture will discuss the mercury and air toxic standards, otherwise known as the MATS rule for power plants.